<laughs> and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. One half of the double-headed monster that is creating Academia Arcanum, the f the fantasy university of your dreams, or nightmares. The one and only Willow. Hi! <laughs> uh, that's me, I'm Willow. Uh, Aaron's not here at the moment. She's busy doing other stuff. I'm here. Thank you for coming in and bra and braving time zone hell, though there isn't that much of a gap. Yeah, it's I. Uh, it's it's also weird because like me and Myra are in different time zones now because uh, we were together for a few months, but of course we just had to get this uh, starter off in the last month I was with her, so. Things have been pretty hectic this last month. Mm -hmm. Oh, not to mention school starting back up again. University has proven itself to be quite a, a nightmare. This one though, this 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 one that I'm making is is, is much better. Trust me. I'm surprised I, I never got kicked. Don't worry about scheduling outside of with your group, of course. Yeah. I'm surprised I never got I never got um kick I never got kicked out of university for my for my little mirror writing stunt. Which is the best way for me to describe that is, don't don't set a don't set the due date for a paper to be April first, with me around. Otherwise, you get exactly what you have coming. I submit your professors must have loved you. I submitted <laughs> a I submitted a report that was fifteen pages long, double sided, but the text was all mirror written. Oh. And I can't even, I don't even know what's worse, you having to, like, figure out how to write that, or, like, your professors figuring out how to read it. I got called out in front of everybody asking why I did it, and without missing a beat, I said, why'd you set April Fool's Day for the due date? You know, you know what, that's true, that is, <laughs> that's gotta be partially on them, right? I, I, mean... I, still, I still passed, but there was an extra note saying, never do this again. <laughs> and the the professor the professor in question had shared photos of him of himself looking at a camera with da with daggers for eyes while ho while holding up a hand mirror to the thing. I think it, I think it was a case of he didn't want to give me the satisfaction of beating him. <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine. Like, I think if I was in that scenario, <laughs> I'm just kind of like hold it up like it's a uh, like I'm a. Uh... Having my mug shot taken. <laughs> Just read it through with the fucking mirror. Mm -hmm. Oh, and it's I've got I've gotten the nickname the prankster prince for for a reason. <laughs> but <laughs> in all in all fairness, if you're if you're if you're not giving your players nightmares, are you doing your job as a as a GM? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not even if you're just doing horror. I mean, come on, you gotta, you gotta really up the stakes sometimes. Give them, give them something to latch on to and just take it all away. Mm -hmm. Or in, in some cases, it's just people not listening because there's always that one person who thinks, "Oh, this role is going to be easy." It's not. They like look, try and look it up ahead of time if you're doing like a module or like be like, "Oh, you know." Could be that hard. It's just you know you just gotta do a couple checks and oh, well. Oh, but then you change the the, the monster stats and oh now they can do this and you just have a disregard for all of its abilities. Well, and you. I think in one fun. case it was. I know you. I know you said there's no way I could I could hit that number, but I do have a five percent chance of automatically succeeding. And he rolls, and it's a fumble. Five percent is still only five percent. Five percent at succeeding greatly. Five percent at failing horribly. It's... Such is the way of the D twenty. Well, I've I've stated that the dice gods are a true model of equality, because it does not matter your 
your your gender, your background, height, weight, occupation, whatever they hate you. Except for uh, when you're trying to like do like a really low roll, like you're playing Call of Cthulhu, and you need that like one or two, mm -hmm. and then they give you a one hundred. <laughs> Very confused sometimes. Oh, like I <laughs> like I said, they hate like I said they hate you, and they want you to suffer. But hey. That's why this game has no dice, yeah. except for like one instance. Yeah. But <laughs> speaking speaking of that, I I like to go into the humble beginnings. So, walk me through your first introduction to tabletop and what made it stick. Uh, I've always kind of been a more creative person. I've loved writing, you know, ever since I was a kid, making like little stories for class. It was probably always like my favorite part of school. And I always, like, knew D&D &D and like, stuff existed. I always thought just D&D &D was the only TTRPG, as most people probably thought. It's, uh... It was always, you know, seen as, like, the, the nerdy thing to do. And, I mean, I was a nerd, but I didn't really want to admit it. <laughs> uh, but... You know, I was just bored one day, and one of my friends was like, Hey! One of our players left. Do you uh, want to join us? We're only like three sessions in. I'm like, uh, okay. It's it's not like I owed a favor to the guy, but I mean, hey, you know what? My my Wednesdays were open anyways, so why not? So I initially like rolled up this just this little character. And then the the GM was like, oh, don't be so modest, you know, make make something grand. <laughs> so, ugh. And then I made this, like, fucking, basically, like, a Sonic OC <laughs> tier type character. Oh, it was, it was just horrible. But uh, the game, it was, re it was really fun. It was, it was nice being able to write a story through the perspective of a character by being that character. Where you don't have influence on outside things. It's just whatever your actions do, that's what you do. But everyone else, that's a wild card that you have to play around. Mm -hmm. that, that was always just so interesting to me and as I grew older I was more and more interested in telling stories and sure books are nice but I like to say that having writing like a document or a book or a novel or what have you it's just one story will only ever be one story, no matter how great it is. But if you make a TTRPG, it's a platform for anyone to make countless stories. Mm -hmm. That's kind of stuck with me, that sort of train of thought. And that's what uh, led me down making, ultimately, Academia Arcanum. Mm -hmm. And I know you I know you said that early, early on... Um... You had felt that D and D was the was the only game was the only game in town. Pardon the pun. But did you jump around between systems over the years before you decided to start making Academia Arcanum? Yeah, I've played a few. Cyberpunk Red was one that I played like a one shot of, and like some play by those games. Call of Cthulhu was probably one of my favorite campaigns that I was running in. It was like a a World War II set like just after it started it was it was pretty cool we were like playing like ordinary people being caught up into it uh, there was 10 candles which was like more of a post apocalyptic game that we were we were doing uh, there was also a little bit of Pathfinder but oh it was it was just too complicated for me <laughs> same with Starfinder I just couldn't wrap my head around it there was too many numbers all at once too many conditions I just I just could not do it um yeah I've shopped around mm -hmm. probably not as much as uh other game designers but I've definitely read a lot I've you know I've read Blade in the dark uh oh yeah i've also played monster of the week but i've read a lot of games uh but it's not really common for me to actually be able to play them it's mm -hmm. it's very hard to find a group yep um i've i've had i've had i've had mixed approaches when it comes when it comes to set when it comes to setting up groups um of course these days these days i have 
it's easier than ever for, for me to do it. Um, but what it what has been what has been a bit nu has been a bit nuts is find is finding how, finding the interesting approaches because there there have been some people who are one system lifers who end up designing and some people who are not and it is consistently inconsistent yeah <laughs> oh. that that's why I like that's why I like to dive into these or these origin stories just to see how someone's pro someone's particular project came to be and Academia Arcanum, you've you've described as um, gothic fantasy. Yeah. So, to lead, are to lead into my next question, are you familiar with the concept of Appendix N? Uh, haven't heard of that. No. It's that was that was a section in old school D and D that was ba that was basically designated for. Inspirational media, whether it be books, film, co comics, t TV, you you get the idea. Um, that's it's since been used as a shorthand for that particular area in a given project. What sort of what what media, what sto what stories, what what films, games, what have you would be in Academia Arcanum's um, Appendix N? Oh gosh! I mean, honestly, I'm gonna have to say uh, Call of Cthulhu. What was was one? Of course, you have Harry Potter with the whole magical school theme. Uh, but another thing is, uh, Meyer and I both kind of got the inspiration to make this game after, uh, after we were like playing MTG and getting like spoilers for uh, Strixhaven. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of had this D and D game for Strixhaven before the book came out. <laughs> we were actually really excited when that happened, um, and it was it was really interesting for us to uh, see through, like getting through all these characters, getting to know them. We thought it was a very interesting idea to be able to have this game where you have this character who grows over time, and like they meet all these people, but they're not just like not going places. You're not an adventurer. You're just staying in one campus so that you can really sink your teeth into all the mysteries that delve uh, beneath. Like, uh, there was this sort of secret shop that uh, Ira had made that uh, you could only access it by going through this one door, which changed all the time, every hour on the hour, and inside you could get whatever your heart desired, but you had to pay an equal price, and they didn't take money. And that was so cool to me, and it made me wonder what other secrets are there here. And I wanted to, with this game, share that experience, share those ideas. Gosh, look at me, I'm getting off topic. <laughs> no, don't, do not worry about that. We, ne we never, um, we, ne I never come, I never come into these things with a plan. <laughs> oh yeah, me, me neither, I, uh. Had like another uh, thing mm -hmm. uh, with uh, but, in the random worlds RPG chat room with Dan. Yeah, I, I've I know I know him. I've <laughs> I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say I'm I'm but I'm huge buds with him. But I know I know of him. Uh. I mean, yeah, that's a, that, that's apparent. <laughs> There's oh, all rivals you are. It's like antagonistic. Uh, although I've occasion occasionally I've made jokes that it's impossible for me to be rivals with anybody shorter than me. <laughs> Which, well, I mean, if you're looking for someone who's equal on all fronts. You might uh, find yourself woefully alone. My co-host is the same height as me, and he, and um, he and I seem to have seem to have developed a master class in finding ways to annoy each other. <laughs> that would be a sight to see. And the. 
Now, with with that in, with that in mind, um, I I really wanted to focus on the on the gothic part of well, gothic fantasy since that has its own um, incarnations. We wanted to uh, we wanted to steer very well into the realm of what gothic really means. We wanted to focus on the emotional part of it. And we think that delves really well with magic, where, uh, you know, where if your emotions are heightened, then your magic changes with it. Mm -hmm. We always thought, like, especially when watching a movie or shows that depict mages, uh, that those parts always seem to resonate with us more often. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm personally a huge fan of gothic horror. Uh, I've read Dracula, Frankenstein, Whole Nine Yards, played so many games. And I just, well, and also, I just love the vibe. <laughs> awesome. Like, mm -hmm. this whole, like, uh, London kind of setting, or like, uh, old Germany, just like these cobblestone streets, uh, lit by lanterns. It just gets me every time. Mm hmm. And. The 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 thing that I'll always find I will always find in amusing when it comes to it is, well, you can you can ruin any fa any fairy tale by saying everyone dies in the German version. <laughs> yeah, fuck yeah, like fairy tales. Also, I forgot to say that like Grimm's fairy tales are definitely also a bit of an inspiration when thinking about like magical curses and such like that. Um, have you ever seen Have you ever seen the Free Shooter? I have not. Um, that's not. That's not the. Uh, I'm only saying that because I don't want to. I don't want to screw up the German. Um, Die Fisch Schultz. The sh the story of about the about the devil's rifle that the six five bullets will shoot at will shoot wherever wherever they're supposed to. The but the sixth bullet is the devil's bullet. Uh, it's. It's an inter it is a interesting um opera and is infamous for the wolf for the wolf's glen se scene of somebody getting to tossed into a de into a den full of wolves uh, but given that we're dealing w given that we're dealing with a magical school um Magic itself in storytelling is one is one of those blank checks that you have to that you end up writing, because there's so many different ways it can take shape. So, when it comes to the nat when it comes to the nature of ma of magic use within the within the setting, how do you, how do you go about writing that per that hypothetical um, check? Well, uh, we kind of just, well, when we were, like, thinking about what kind of magic should be available, we thought, where does magic come from? That's That was our main thought. Why does it exist? And we were, like, thinking about it from that lens and decided that magic is just a thing imbued into the land. That it is the world, essentially. Which is, uh, admittedly, a very common thing uh, in fantasy but we didn't want to overcomplicate it uh, we didn't want to attach too much lore to it so that people could create their own should they choose we didn't want things to be too trenched in with the uh, mechanics and the story and whatever because ultimately it is a story of whoever is <laughs> jamming the game and whoever their players are uh, but of course, if you are making a game with magic, you need you know rules on how that magic works. That's how we kind of came up with the uh, kind of star logo that we uh, have been using, designed by Myra, mm -hmm. which has some motifs from um, stars, the uh, compass, uh, where each side is one of the main uh, magical focuses. We have, of course, uh, Ios, which is on the right, 
and under is elemental, and you have psyche on the left, and then cosmos, of course, facing the stars. Mm-hmm. But in, in the middle is the fundamental magic that ties it all together. Yeah. Essentially, magic in this game can do a wide variety of things, and that nothing is completely locked off on either side. They're all connected in some way can use telekinesis as a psyche mage to to lift an object just as you might use gravity magic to lift an object or using wind magic to make an object float in the air there's you know a wide variety of ways to go about things Mm -hmm. all trying to solve puzzles and problems by using you know what you can do as a character with your magical focus and with that in with that in mind when it com- when it comes to when it, co- when it comes to the magic setup you have it th- you have noted that nouns verbs and adjectives are are combined to create effects um, yes so uh, it's what i'm curious about is if is if that is if that means it's going to be a free form of a somewhat a somewhat freeform affair where there isn't a defined spell list but a collection of of effects essentially tags precisely uh, it's basically everything is very freeform as a mage you have you uh, choose what words you know and you can combine those words to create spells uh, this was very much inspired by Magic of the Gathering, mm-hmm. where you see all these cool, well, you see all this art for these cool instants and these sorceries that you can cast, and like they, of course, they have they cost mana, but like the names evoke an image, which is then you know you see it through the art and through the flavor text and the the mechanics itself. It's all drenched together and we thought that would be a perfect way to be able to cast spells in uh, TTRPG Mm -hmm. and so that's why I wanted to do it this way we uh, saw our Smagica something similar but we felt it was too it was too broad it was wasn't very poetic (laughs) so to speak and ours Magica is doing the passion play thing You know, There's a. It's it the, the 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 implication with Ars Magica is that you're supposed to be um, playing playing multiple um, characters, so that complicates things further. Yeah, we wanted to just have everyone playing their one single character that changes and is dynamic, and that's why we have such a lengthy, detailed life path system. Is mm-hmm. because we want to really get into character and become that character throughout the course of the game. Mm-hmm. And with the with that in with that in mind, since you brought up the life path system, let's go let's go into that. Um, since you mentioned Cyberpunk Red. Was that the inspiration for you to do a li- a life path system? Actually, it was Traveler. Oh, uh, the one we the one where you die during character creation. Got it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we uh, liked that there was like this like you had these list of questions that you ask, and you kind of go through everything, and you make roles. We weren't like huge fans of the roles. We knew why it was there. We kind of preferred things to be a lot more intentional. That's why the uh, GM in this game is called the director because they call the shots. Everything that they do is it has intent beneath it. it isn't there? Isn't some you know if the random dice gods <laughs> that uh, will smite you down if you don't roll a high enough number, or sometimes it, sometimes just smite you because they feel like it. Precisely. Um, so during life path, like the life path system, you uh, initially you start off as a little child, very small, very weak. You choose how were you born? 
reborn to someone rich, be a poor family, maybe something more middle class. But whether you're born in a city or a town or some remote village off in the middle of nowhere, what occupations did your guardians have? Were you born with any disabilities or illnesses that might have affected you growing up? Then, you know, you go through all these questions. And then you get a conflict at the end of it. And that conflict is created by the GM. And depending on how your character reacts to it, different things may happen. Like, let's say, you know, we're at, like, the prom equivalent in high school. And, like, like a bully, like, tries to, like, uh, <laughs> like embarrasses you horribly. How do you react to that situation? How do you respond? I am the worst person to ask that because I ru because I ruined I I ruined the prom. Just like throw the bunch like throw the punch bowl at someone and see see what happens. Um the There was a there was a tradition that there's a special goblet that the prom king has that the prom king drinks from. Um, oh, I I, me I messed with that. I messed with the punch. Oh no! <laughs> A special goblin. Yeah, I think it's because they're trying to emulate the winter carnival, and that has its own little royal family. It's a complicated thing, um, but <laughs> because the guy who would who would become who was gonna be. In my junior year, the guy who was going to be was going to become prom king deci decided to mess with me and mess with my stuff, so I decided to get back at him by humiliating him in front of the entire school. Because I, because I put a little ex I put a little something extra in the pu in the punch. Nothing mal nothing malicious. Just he had to run to the bathroom afterwards. <laughs> well, that'll teach them to uh, get on your bad side. Oh. Because I, f I figured just picking a fight with him wouldn't wouldn't um accomplish anything. So, best to best to create me best to create mental scarring that he'd never get that he'd never get over. <laughs> I do direct violence when you can do indirect violence and have the same result without the bruises. Um, is this a bad time to mention my favorite Shakespeare play is Titus Andronicus? You know the really <laughs> messed up one. The one that'll make you never look at meat pies the same way again. Oh, don't remind me. <laughs> but it is interesting that you bring up Magic: The Gathering and and the like because of so of how MTG has so many keywords just beyond the type of spell. Yeah, yeah. there. There, it's also like quite a learning curve to get into MTG just because of how complicated the game is. Like, I'm pretty sure it's been ranked as like the world's most complicated game because of just how many deck combinations there can be. Well, some of that was by design because I do remember, I do remember Garfield saying that he wanted a deck in Magic: The Gathering to be akin to a character sheet. Like that's like a really cool thing because sometimes when I make characters, I like make little like for TTRPGs, I make yes. decks for them. <laughs> does that mean? Does that like mean I... that at at one point you've got you've gone full degeneracy and made us and made a sliver deck? Well, I mean, I wouldn't call it degeneracy. You know, slivers, they're just little guys. They're adorable. How could I not make a sliver deck just once? I think it. Look at them go. I, I do... like the M14 ones, yeah. like all the other slivers. They're just little guys. Well, I'm, I'm not one to talk because some of my because some of my decks can be best described as drunken boxing. As long as you're not playing stacks, we're okay. Yeah. No, no, I never, I never did anything like that. It was, I would do that, or I would do, I would do a whole lot of troll decks. That weren't de that weren't designed to win, but just to, but just annoy people. Oh, like chaos strategies using stuff like uh, what's it called? Like World Warp World, or like uh, 
It's those things that take an, a, mil, a million years to resolve. Oh, I, I like, think switch up the board. Yeah, I, th I think I, I think I had I had one that was just a good old fashioned Zerg rush. Just flood, just flood my whole, just flood my whole side with, um, with one ones. You know, so there, so there's more, there's more monsters than than somebody can reasonably take, and if they try and bring out their beefy boy for counterattacks, um, there's too, there's too, there's too many to to even think about trying to do direct attacks. Yeah, that reminds me of when a guy, former friend, uh, this is this might uh, be one of the reasons why it's former, played a uh, Zergo deck. But it was just a lot of wraths. So, Wrath of God, Damnation, uh, had fucking Jokel Hops in there for some fucking reason. So, sent us all back to the Stone Age repeatedly while he kept smashing our faces in with a 7 2. Mm. We just could not get rid of. Yeah, that tracks. <laughs> but. Now, give now. Given that, given that, um, you've got the five. The five that you have are fundamental: bios, cosmos, psyche, and um, and elemental. Um, yes. And would it be fair of me to say that the the use of nouns, ver verbs, and adjectives are you bi are you building a hypothetical deck? Just not, just not in, just not as complicated. You could definitely like think of it like that. Yeah, I always kind of thought of it as like you have all these like you have these ingredients, and like a spell is like you know a nice meal, or a snack, or just just something, and you can oh this is this adjective you know it's kind of like Italian seasoning, hmm. like this noun is like bread or like and then kind of mix it all together and you make this cool spell so it's really interesting because whenever you gain a new word not just gaining a spell you're gaining the possibility for hundreds of spells and given that given that i'm pretty i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure that some people have found unorthodox way ways of ways of using spells um and of of course, when it comes to unorthodox use, the the visual example I always bring up is um, Dark Messiah of Might and Magic. I love that game. Right? I never got around to finishing it, but just being able to like kick people into spikes. Well, I like, just kick people. I think I think uh, Mandalore said it best when he said, "Do not think of yourself as a fantasy hero. Think of yourself as Ke as Kevin McAllister in Home Alone." you really are with like the, the ice spell that just like freezes the floor and then they doop, 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 and they slip on it <laughs> well that and interesting things you can do with a sh with a chandelier the the f um the fact that so much of it is so much of the sandbox is set is setting up traps to to make enemies fall into to the point that it almost becomes a looney tunes short someone just like there's this like giant tower and you like put uh, a little bit of ice on like the top of the stairs and you aggro them so they run down it and they go all the way down the stairs mm -hmm. and oh. the... I do miss that yeah of course of granted dark messiah was a bit janky in some places and the st and the stealth felt like felt like it um was working but it was always working against me well, yeah, but I mean, you know, if you uh, just like remastered that game for the modern era, there you go. You got a free money machine right there. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd I'd imagine what would make it tricky is that there's not as many people using the Source Engine these days. It's true. You don't really have to use the Source Engine. You just like make it from the ground up. <laughs> I've l I have uh, no, then it's not exactly free money. <laughs> I've learned I've learned that that whole that whole motif of building it from the ground from the ground up, depending on the engine, is some is sometimes easier said than done. Um, 
the reason why everybody keeps making fun of the creation engine is because that thing is held together with duct tape and prayer. Oh, yeah, but, like, uh... What's that? And that, like... One rag is on it, but it's really nice. Um... Uh. I know, I know people will, I know people will rag on Unre Unreal, but it's Unreal. Yes, that's it. <laughs> um, it depends on the version of Unreal. the The one that was in the seventh generation was a bit jank, but I've seen some like pretty interesting games come out of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, the oh, and the, I'm not. There certainly are, and de and definitely for a treasure hunter like myself. <laughs> But <laughs> given given that this is this is built around a a uh, magical university, uh, would it be fair? Do you ha do you have a system in place that ca that kind of covers the 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 way the way someone's day to day schedule would be like when it comes to their particular classes and how that affects how their character develops? Yes, that's actually one of the main things we wanted to focus on, was classes and extracurriculars and your peers. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you don't have to like schedule things like, oh, this is like an 8 a.m. class. That means I have to get up early, and that, then I take a negative modifier to my to my thing or whatever. And unless I drink coffee, well, that's an extra minute. Yeah, you're not gonna have to like. St there's already enough stress with real university and scheduling. Didn't want to recreate that here. Mm -hmm. Basically, you pick from this list of different classes, and each, of course, each different type of magic has its own class list. And depend, and you know, with those classes, you get uh, certain words, or you get to choose from a list of words that those class would uh, give you. It's not really much. You don't have to like role play out the classes. There's going to be, of course, sheets. It's like, oh, hey, if you want to do this, here's like a neat little adventure you can run. But uh, let's be honest, does anyone really want to like role play through an entire lecture on like aeromancy and aerodynamics? <laughs> to be honest, real already university lectures are putting me to sleep. I don't need a, a fantasy <laughs> university lecture to, to be in my scheduled once a week uh, TRPG game. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I think, I think, I think you can make some interesting shenanigans when it comes to, um, when it comes to practice, when it comes to the practical classes. Oh, yeah. and there's, there's a few ideas down there, but we don't really get too, too into detail on it because there's other stuff we want to focus on, like uh, mainly extracurriculars and peers, mm -hmm. which are so much more interesting, personally. <laughs> Because I've always been, of course, gravitating more towards extracurriculars rather than, uh, you know, normal courses because they're the things that you really want to do. That's things that you actively sign up for. And each peer has uh, two extracurriculars they are for sure in, and one tertiary that is a secret, but uh, only the GM knows it, and they can, like, whip it out at a moment's notice. So. If like let's say you have a character who like really wants to uh, like stuff with like uh, swords and they're like huge into like fencing, but uh, one of the characters that uh, they want to interact with isn't shown to be in the fencing club. Well, that can be a neat little surprise if your GM pulls it out there, mm -hmm. as long as it fits within the character. Each peer has a full, full page chock full of information about them. Their likes, their dislikes, their history, have essentially their own little life path session, as well as ways you might want to introduce them, like little quests that you might go on to uh, go, hey, this guy fucked up and did this thing, and now golems running around everywhere. Yeah. And I <laughs> whoop de do with securities uh, on lunch break. I do. I do recall. I do recall. Because I, because I have been, I've been developing the idea of an adventurer's academy, um, because I felt Strixhaven didn't go far enough, <laughs> and I remember one, I remember that one of the teachers we designed was, had had 
had a bit of a rule that if you if you end up misbehaving too much, you end up getting relegated to stretching practice. Um, that because one now one one would th one would think oh just doing a few just doing a few stretches that's not too bad. He's not the one doing it; it's his wife who does it, and his wife is a contortionist. I can see her. That's gonna lead because. <laughs> Being in, it was it. Was, I had an interesting experience being the being the one tall guy in a yo, in a yoga class once. <laughs> I think everybody was ta was taking best to see how long it would take before I cracked. I didn't, but <laughs> <laughs> like I'm the only I'm the only guy in the class, and everybody's a bunch of five foot nothings, and I'm not. One thing uh, I'd like to add with the. Uh... Years is that we uh, are planning to have them all on like little cards. I, I don't, I don't really have any I can show you legally because <laughs> we did a, like a little test few games, mm -hmm. test runs, but uh, we didn't pay for any art for them. So it's just using a bunch of art we found on like Pinterest and whatever mm -hmm. because uh, we're poor. <laughs> That's why we're on Kickstarter. It's because we're poor. Mm -hmm. Now. Given now, I, this is definitely a rules light game, but when it comes when it comes to die rolling, it you talk you talked about developing your your own skill system, but is it a case where you're where you're rolling dice, or is 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 this a mostly diceless affair? It's entirely diceless outside of one aspect where you roll. Eights essentially. Whenever when when you okay, let's let's roll down like combat stuff. Okay, whenever you're hurt, and that being hurt can be any number of things. It can be someone insulting you. It can be actually getting like hit with like a spell, or getting like <laughs> or a more serious cases like being stabbed. Anyway, anywhere, any eh, any time would be put like stressed mm -hmm. basically of your mana turns a volatile and when you and so instead of just regenerating one mana each turn you regenerate one mana plus all of your volatile mana each turn so it's a give and take and is, is whenever you is volatile mana mana a case of when you when you use it something else happens Yes, uh, it was inspired by like how like PBTA games and like Monster of the Week use spell casting, where like mishaps occur, and then like you and the GM both decide what exactly that mishap is. Like if you're using pyromancy, you might burn something or yourself or someone you care about that you didn't really intend to, or like when you use like. Uh, course magic to manipulate someone's mind that might like backlash and happen to you too so whenever you roll a one or two on a d8 or just one on a d4 but i don't really like using d4s you have a uh a, a, a mishap that occurs for every one you've got so you roll a die for every Spent uh, volatile mana you use. So, if you have a lot of volatile mana and you use it all on one very very big spell, <laughs> you can expect a lot of things to go wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, I should note that a, a habit I have is giving my players um powerful equipment or, or abilities, but also also very dangerous. The benchmark that I use for what I mean by powerful but dangerous is. The noisy cricket and men in black. You know, does does a hell of a lot of damage and can punch hole and can punch holes through so, through solid metal, but every time you fire it, you're getting recoiled and you're getting th you're getting thrown on your ass. <laughs> Something like that. Oh. So you always kind of want to start off by using smaller spells that you can bounce back from, but as the fight goes on and things get more and more tense you'll have more and more volatile mana mm -hmm. so it'll be more and more 
like you know theatrical and cinematic as you start slaying these massive spells so it's it's definitely something you can play on to it's mm-hmm. definitely narrative first yeah. but the mechanics help to facilitate that now when it comes to when it comes to ma- when it comes to magic is is it a case where where a magic user has to have a particular focus? That's typically the case. Uh, people, like, I, uh... How mana works in this game is that you start off with uh, three mana of any type. But if you choose fundamental, you instead gain two fundamental mana, which it's basically like how colorless mana would work in MTG. Mm-hmm. Like, you use it to pay generic costs. So you get more... And you can use it to do fundamental words that are a bit more basic, like conjure, or control, infuse, invoke, those sorts of words. Greater, lesser, missile, volley, things that don't fit into the other uh, categories. Other than that, you have to spend mana of a certain type to cast certain spells, like Bios Magic uses bios mana elemental magic uses elemental mana and it and so on and so forth so kind of think of it like you're building your own legendary creature in mtg you like like your mana cost is like how much mana you have and then like your like silly little abilities which are like the words you have and your power and toughness which is like your total mana amount Mm mm-hmm it's like something silly like that. Yeah, that de- that definitely makes sense. Now, with that with that in mo- with that in mind, since since that since that was since that was mentioned, um, I am I am curious if you do if you do have a few a few charts in mind to to help to help ease people to help ease people into ha- into um story seed concepts. To get the ball rolling, since this is going to be an unusual ki- kind of adventuring system. Yeah, and we have a mechanic for that that uh, Myra and I like to call setting the scene. Essentially, the GM puts out a plain kind of environment, and they set up all the basic elements like uh, what's going on, who's there, etc. And then you go around the table, and everyone adds their own element to the scene. So, someone might say, oh, I want this person there, and they're there. No questions are asked. Um, someone might say, oh, uh, two people are having a duel over here. And it's like, okay, they're having a duel. What's the duel about? Then you have, and you you know go on until everyone's been able to add something to the scene. It adds a lot more of a sort of a personal touch where people can get really invested in the thing that they've added. Entire storylines can be created just around something you set the scene with. It helps to make keep the players engaged, especially if they're not the focus of the scene at that particular time. Mm-hmm. So, within now, when it comes to tail totems, or not, not totems, tokens... That's definitely that's definitely in the vein of in the vein of a narrative meta currency. Am I correct? It is. It is most certainly a meta currency just for the narrative. It is used to create to uh, purchase mystic items, which you can have as real world items that players can find if they're like searching around, or you can just have it be like buy it from me at the end of a session and we don't talk about it, it's not in a real game you just bring it up when you want to use it mm-hmm. these things let you twist the narrative so to speak, it lets you change things stuff like the uh, void knapsack lets you produce an item, just an item any item that you want as long as it's a magical like you can make a rope appear or a ladder or just you just get a new thing that you could theoretically fit into your backpack. Yeah. 
I do find it interesting when it comes to the relationships that characters can have that you've built it around that a similar rule of five that you have with magic. Was that intentional or did it just happen by accident? Uh, we both we wanted to do, uh, have like the five point system for both, so we tried to limit the number of like different uh, types of relationships with the same amount as the types of magic because we thought you know the rule of five kind of seems kind of cool. Mm -hmm. I'm just so a, that's why we. Yeah, I'm just a sucker for when you have a recurring motif. Uh, it's <laughs> we're trying to make it look all pretty. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, and, with that with that in mind, what would you were there any were there any instances when you were concepting Academia Arcanum where there was an idea that that sh that showed up, but as things went on, it kind of it it kind of it kind of fade it kind of faded out because it just didn't fit with how the game was developing. Oh yeah, honestly, uh, if Myra was here, uh, she'd probably say something along the lines of, "I don't know if we had a if we had a dollar for every time uh, Hello added something and then deleted it later, <laughs> we'd probably have enough money to fund the game." Mm -hmm. uh, do you ha do you have plans on opening up playtesting anytime in the future? We've done playtests in the past, uh, and we're probably going to do more in the future, especially with how the Kickstarter seems to be going at this current moment. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have a lot more time to, well, in between classes, of yeah. course, to uh, you know, play test with people who are interested and maybe get another Kickstarter up later on. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, will, mm -hmm. I will certainly look forward to seeing how, how, it, how it develops and whether or not you put any sort of any sort of um, interesting rhyming with some, with some of these spell flavor text, like say like say the old deflection spell from early magic, like like uh, the negate in the uh, Ixalan was was really nice. Uh, yeah. Up, down, That's over, and through, that. back around. The joke's on you. <laughs> yeah. As one nature lifts its voice to tell you this, no. Well, mother mother nature is on the drugs. <laughs> Which ones? Yes. Even that All one. of them. I mean, that's the one that made them, right? <laughs> but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the particular brand of madness that happens here. Of course. I just... Uh... Yeah, it's it's been really nice. Uh, I just going over the Kickstarter now. I realize that uh, I did not uh, showcase the uh, different types of relationships you got. Mm -hmm. I did briefly, but oh, I could have gone into so much more detail. Mm -hmm. Respect, trust, attachment, romance, bond—how they all go up and down, and how they fuel your your link moves. Sure, totally persona inspired. <laughs> The, you would not be the first nor the last to draw to draw upon persona. It's I I have a friend Lilith who is utterly obsessed with persona, utterly obsessed with it. And meanwhile, I'm like, get on my level. I've been obsessed with Mega Ten f lo long before that. <laughs> He's the one who uh, made me get into like, oh, you gotta try Persona Three. I'm like, okay, I'll try it. <laughs> Though it, it is fun, it is funny to me when I watch somebody who only knows about Persona and not the greater um, Megami Tensei series, and then they then they pick up one then they pick up one of the mainline Mega Ten games and get their shit kicked in. Yeah, I've I haven't played one of those uh, yet. It's definitely on the list. I, I like them. Too many games but... I want to play. It. Too much, too little time to actually play them. I like I I like make I like mainline Mega Ten, but sometimes but more often than not, it does not like you back. Yeah, I've heard I've heard that it can be quite unforgiving. Oh, it it definitely is. Um. Then again, 
it would then again it draw it draws a, like a lot of um, console style RPGs because I don't like the term JRPG. It draws upon wizardry, and wizardry was not easy. So many games I need to play. I haven't even heard of wizardry. Yeah, wizard wizardry is is one of, is an old is a old staple. Well, I'd love to try it sometime. I'm trying to play uh, Icewind Dale uh, a few days ago. Yeah, I I style myself as a bit of a historian. Um, <laughs> most well, definitely playing the part where you uh, about uh, things I have no idea about. So you're you're there already. Though I, I have the, no intention on doing on doing professor style lectures because I would be a terrible lecturer. Well, I mean, considering the professors I've had, I think you'd do just fine. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not up my own ass enough. You know what? <laughs> Fair enough. Am I an egotist? Oh, de oh, definitely. But I'm not. But I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to be. I'm. I'm not going to be in the smoking room if you catch my drift. How people actually had those? <laughs> well, that that's kind of the joke. <laughs> but I do. I. Anytime you do see fit to return to the temple to for, to further explore um, Academia Arcanum, the door is always open. As I often Strange. say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> this isn't the last you'll see of me. Academia Arcanum is maybe my first project, but it won't be the last. Mm -hmm. Myra and I have so much cooking up. Yep. Don't even you can't even believe it. Oh, I can. <laughs> Uh, Even if this fails, we've got more in store. Mm -hmm. Just you lay it. But and and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. Bye.